it feels like I should say good morning, although I know that that is not, not technically true, but it, the, uh, the cool and the gray make it seem like an early hour. Oh, uh, thank you for uh, this time to speak to you. I'm going to talk about uh, some poems, a pair of poems by Mae Swenson um, today. And uh, I do this in part because I think that Swenson is an intriguing and underread poet for uh, a number of reasons, perhaps, uh, some of which we'll have time to investigate a little later on. Um, she seems to me uh, a poet who offers uh, undiscovered pleasures for readers and also some really interesting possibilities for uh, contemporary poets uh, to mine as well. Um, I also do this because next month in Logan, Utah, is the first uh, conference devoted to Swenson's work. And so this is a, a talk in progress, which I'm going to be delivering there. And I'll hope to uh, learn a little bit more about it uh, today and, and what, my, what gaps I, I might want to address. So I, I think all I need to tell you about uh, this, this little essay is that uh, I was working on it this spring while I was doing a, a guest teaching job at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, which had lured me by offering me a, that, this deal. I got to teach one uh, graduate uh, class and was allowed to live in a beach house on a barrier island on the Atlantic coast there, which sounded like the most wonderful deal. But I hadn't imagined that the, the beach house would be one of those southern houses built up on stilts, which the wind howls underneath and that it would be the coldest winter in uh, recent memory in North Carolina. So much time was spent huddling and bundled. And in fact, one of the, the only real pleasures, it turned out, of living in this beach house was collecting seashells, uh, which were wonderful shells available there. And of course, it was so frigid that no, there was no competition for these shells. I, I could find them all myself. And that found its way into this piece, as, as you will hear. This is called Question, as in the title of one of these poems, Question and More Questions, Two Shells from Mae Swenson. And I want to start out just by reading the first of these poems, Question. Body, my house, my horse, my hound, what will I do when you are fallen? Where will I sleep? How will I ride? What will I hunt? Where can I go without my mount, all eager and quick? How will I know in thicket ahead is danger or treasure when body, my good, bright dog, is dead? How will it be to lie in the sky without roof or door and wind for an eye with cloud for shift? How will I hide? The southern barrier island where I'm living this winter is a good place for finding shells. Some days at the base of the swell of sand where the tide's been busy washing the island away, there are dense patches of them. Orangey scallops, oysters in cream, white, and charcoal. And my favorite, the black whelks, whorled things which look like they're made of lava. There are more delicate, smooth, gray whelks, too. These are seldom whole. They must take a beating on their way to shore. And often, they are reduced to the slim spike of the shell's core. Where once there was an elaborate architecture, the shell curving inward into its labyrinthine recesses, now all that's left is the twisting center. At the top remains evidence of the many spiraling rooms. It's like looking into a partly demolished building where the walls were torn away, and you can see into the old chambers of apartments. Then the stalk tapers down, twisting to a near dagger point at the tip. The whole thing resembles some strange Victorian hat pin, or a Viennese Art Nouveau tree, or what would have resulted if Rodin had sculpted Loey Fuller dancing in her veils. I watch myself write that description. I wanted to begin with a sense of spareness to evoke the lean, abstracted form of the shell. But as soon as I look closely at it, the spiral, unlikely thing resting on my desk right now, my language immediately begins to expand, 
to reach for metaphoric equivalents. That's my want, my turn of mind, as if what the pressure of attention produces are sketches, verbal attempts to render aspects of the world, and no one attempt will suffice. It takes a raft of tropes, demolition, hat pin, tree, dance of the veils, to catch something of the texture of reality. Temperamentally inclined to fullness, I am intrigued by the spare, the paired away, in the way that people who live in cluttered houses look with envy at the sleek modernist interiors in design magazines. I admire it, but I doubt I could ever do it. And therefore, I am all the more intrigued by the sheer elemental quality of this poem, which seems itself to have been tumbled down to its core, worn away to a spine of meaning. What could be more elemental than this? How will it be to live in the sky without roof or door and wind for an eye? That, oddly, is almost exactly what's happened to my shell. Roof and door have been sanded away. Wind blows right through the opened eye socket. There is no more protection offered by the house, only the spare sculptural core around which a body once resided. Maybe the first thing to notice in May Swenson's elegant little song is the swiftness of its opening. Body, my house. No introductory warm up here, and no punctuation either, just three words, telegraphing a metaphor as unornamented as an equation. The image is ancient and somehow comfortable. The flesh as the well-fitting shell of a self. Soul's inhabitation, mind's dwelling place. The idea of the self as the body's occupant is immediately extended and complicated by the next line. If I have a horse and a hound and a house, then I'm a rider and a hunter, presumably, even perhaps a sort of lord of the manor. I have chattel and agency. I have animal assistance to do my bidding and perform the tasks I assign. But it's rather odd that the poem isn't just describing the body, but actively addressing it. Swenson's poem is so confident that we don't think at first about the strangeness of this. But in truth, when do you ever speak directly to your own body, as if it were an independent being? Renaissance poets used to do so in dialogues between soul and body or between profane and sacred aspects of the self. But here, only the I, the questioning subjectivity, the anxious self, sings to the flesh in what's both a love poem and only three lines in, already a lament. What will I do? I speaks with love and fear because she depends upon these agents. If they are, in fact, external, then what and where and how will she be when they're gone? What and where and how? The poem turns on the repetition of these terms of questioning. Interestingly, when is never a question here, but a given. The horse will fall. The good, bright dog of the body will sometime be gone. What, where, and how begin each new sentence but the final one? and give the poem its feeling of driving forwardness, the hurrying motion of running animals. If I isolate these, these questioning words from the rest of the poem, they make for an urgent litany of yearning. And just look down that left-hand margin. What, where, how, what, where, how, how, how. And that, that car alarm out there is the perfect <laughs> corollary to that. Uh, 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 uh. That insistent litany of questions. How, how, how. And the fact that that's the term we get last, and we get it three times, right? They, they, they drum out this stunned insistence. How can it be that I will die? And how, how, how is it to be disembodied, to be unhoused in the sky? One of the things that makes Swenson's poem feel song-like are the shadows of traditional forms ghosting behind it. That opening quatrain feels very complete, and it feels like the beginning of some old ballad. Modern poet that she is, Swenson leaves that four-square feeling of completion behind in the next stanza. And then stanza three feels like two quatrains run together, a feeling that's heightened because that third stanza offers us such clear, firm rhymes. Go and know, 
ahead and dead. Of course, we're meant to hear them, just as we notice that stanza fours another rhyming quatrain nailed to the page with the insistent chime of sky and eye. But the song can't be completed, not quite, because the singer has no answer for her question. The poem ends with a formal fragment, just two lines, heightened by reversing the usual order of syntax, with cloud for shift, how will I hide? You can hear how flat the poem would be if it ended, how will I hide, with cloud for shift. We need that rhyme in the last place in order for the poem to feel formally resolved. But there is more here up Swenson's sleeve. She is a sly poet, so there nearly always is. The careful placement of two n-words, shift and hide, calls a great deal of attention to them and invites us to consider them closely. Shift introduces a new metaphoric term for the body. So far, we've not thought of the flesh as clothing, but now we're asked to think of the speaker as naked, exposed, without her costume of skin. To lose one's clothes, of course, is not nearly as much of a catastrophe as it is to lose one's house or horse or dog. Nakedness is a far more familiar condition than homelessness or powerlessness. She's shown real affection for the body, all eager and quick, good bright dog. But there isn't a sense that these elements are the self. They are its brave lieutenants. And we can't really read this simple and beautiful line with cloud for shift without thinking about the other meaning of shift, since the poem is indeed a contemplation of change, of the prospect of shifting states of being from embodied to disembodied, clothed to nude, to be a naked element of the sky, a participant in atmosphere, unmediated by external agents. Is that such a bad thing? Without your clothes, you can't hide. Perhaps it is a pleasure, a boon, to be unhidden. Swenson doesn't know the answer, of course, and that's why the poem bears this title. And she gives us a very subtle, formal indication that ambivalence lies at the poem's core. The poem is primarily composed of four-syllable lines, which account for that quick hoofbeat quality. There are five-syllable lines scattered throughout, but there's only one six-syllable line. And I think a poem's longest line is often a kind of flag the poet's placed for us there, a sign that here is the crux of the matter. And the longest line in question is, is it's in stanza three, is danger or treasure. Of course, it refers specifically to the body's ability to locate trouble or reward. But I'd suggest it also points to the deep question at the poem's core. If the, poem, if the self is something housed in the body, clothed by it, what will it mean for us to be free of such disguise and restraint? Is it danger or treasure? All the work of pointing toward meaning that's usually performed by commas and periods and their kin is here enacted by line making, by syntax, and by an occasional capital letter to show us where a new unit of thought begins. There is one mark of punctuation in the whole poem, in the final position. And one thing this accomplishes, of course, is to send us back to the poem's title, back to the beginning, to reread, to try to understand where this strange little song has taken us. But it also suggests that there is just one question here. The poem, after all, it isn't called questions, plural. There is one consideration at its core. What is the self? Where is it? Is it a good thing for that self to be hidden in the body? And that day when it will no longer be sequestered, but will be naked to the winds, should we look to that as a wonderful end or a terrifying exposure? Freed of flesh, are we liberated or merely exposed? Yesterday, a glorious morning when the sun was diffused through a thin fog, a fog so suffusing the atmosphere that I can't find a noun for it, not a glaze or a haze or a scrim, but a kind of dispersion of vapor that seemed finally like a thickening of the light, so bright one had to shield one's eyes from the sea. It was a warm hour between storms, and the seed kicked up new shells. 
among them a second core of a whelk, but entirely different. The one I described above was sharp and bleached, reduced to something as severe and lean as bone. But this new shell was all voluptuous curve, all cream and marble texture. The body it evoked is female, voluptuary, classical drapery over real hips and generous curves. And thus it is a shell for Swenson, too. Here she is, after all, in a poem called On Handling Some Small Shells from the Windward Islands. You don't have this one, this is just a little quote. She's celebrating the interiority of the shell, its perpetual coiling inward toward the unseeable. Their curve and continuous spiral intrinsic. Their roll, eternal inversion. The closed, undulant scroll. What is sung here, of course, is the female body. The beautiful sense of curving inward toward a mystery, a hidden chamber. Later in the same poem, the speaker's pleasure in the shell's avocation of female sexuality is made overt. She says the gathered shells are peculiar fossil fruits that suck through ribbed lips and gaping sutures into secret clefts, the sweet wet with a tame taste. Vulviform creatures, or rather their rock-like backs with labial bellies. Now that is a precise description of some particular marine creatures, but it is also undeniably sexy. Lips and gaping, secret clefts, sweet, wet. Swenson is enjoying the eros of her game. And there is decidedly a game-like quality to her evocations of the erotic body. A pleasure in speaking quite clearly while seeming not to do so at all. One can imagine the speaker of the poem I just quoted to you protesting with a smile that she's only talking about shells, after all. This is the poet who, in a poem called Her Early Work, complained about the poem she used to write by saying that, quote, one could never tell who was addressed or ever undressed. End quote. I love that. One could never tell who was addressed or ever undressed. And, and this is true of her early poems, that they're full of these vague, sec these love poems that are all addressed to you. And you is associated with roses and petals and milk and blossoms, and they're terrifically erotic, but you know, she's sort of careful to avoid pronouns, sometimes in absolutely torturous ways. She goes to great lengths to this, and uh, complains about this later uh, in her own poems. The mature Swenson wants to be quite clear about the identity of the beloved, or at least the beloved's gender. Is it because she's still a woman of her generation, born in Utah, after all, in the 1920s? Or because she is simply too much a lover of metaphor, the elusive possibilities of the veil, that she prefers a playful, suggestive indirection to bold directness? So here is the second poem you, you have, Little Lion Face, which is a fascinating love poem. Love poem in drag is um, floral appreciation. Little lion face. Little lion face I stooped to pick among the mass of thick succulent blooms. The twice streaked flanges of your silk sun wheel relaxed in wide dilation. I brought inside, placed in a vase. Milk of your shaggy stem, sticky on my fingers, and your barbs hooked to my hand. Sudden stings from them were sweet. Now I'm bold to touch your swollen neck. Put careful lips to slick petals. Snuff up gold pollen in your navel cup. Still fresh before night, I leave you. Dawn's appetite to renew our glide and suck. An hour ahead of sun, I come to find you. You're twisted shut as a burr, neck drooped unconscious, an inert limp bundle, a furled cocoon, your sun-streaked aureole eclipsed and done. Strange, feral flower, asleep with flame rough wilted, all magic halted, a drink I pour, steep in the glass for your undulant stem to suck. Oh, lift your young neck, open and expand to your lover, hot light, gold corona, widen to sky, I hold you, lion, in my eye, sun up until night. 
Now, could there be a sexier flower in all of American poetry? For the first four stanzas, Swenson's game is to establish the poem's literal level, the picking of a dandelion, and describe the act and flower with obvious sensual pleasure, a quality rendered in part by the rhyme's sensuous music, pick and thick, silk and milk, wide inside, neck and slick, and in part by the sheer gorgeousness of phrasing, the twice-streaked flanges of your silk, sunwheel relaxed in wide dilation. The twice streaked flanges of your silk sunwheel relaxed in wide dilation. To mouth just those 12 words, lips and tongue must move through three long I's, three long E's, one long A, as well as a series of K's and D's that seem to explode at the roof of the mouth and behind the teeth the twice-streaked flanges of your silk sunwheel relaxed in wide dilation. That's a lot of work for muscles of tongue and jaw to do. Right? The passage involves us physically in the sort of tongue and lip work the poem proposes. Consonants, assonance, sibilance. Swenson's indulgently pulled out the stops. The sexual resonance of relaxed in wide dilation can't be missed. And it seems to be Swenson's cue for the fifth stanza's admission of the nature of this metaphoric play. The golden pollens resting in your navel cup. The body of the flower is now double for another body. What's been implicit so far is suddenly explicit, underlined by our glide and suck, a pair of verbs difficult even with some stretch of the imagination to apply to the appreciation of flora. Swenson could easily have underplayed the poem, focusing on vehicle rather than tenor, keeping the erotic implications subtext. But Little Lion Face wants to break loose from the conceit that has generated it. Part of the piece's energy derived from, derives from the poet's pleasure in her own transparency. She not only allows us to see through her game, but makes the game's outrageousness a good part of the point. She is not only hiding in plain sight, but flaunting, as they used to say, a celebration of sexual pleasure. Her conceit delights in dressing up her lover as a flower, only to delight further in stripping the costume away. And yet this playful undressing's a way to pour enormous intensity into the emblem. Listen to that ending, oh lift your young neck, open and expand to your lover hot light. How much work that comma after O accomplishes. O, oh, lift your young neck. Rather than apostrophe, the word becomes an exclamation, a sexual sigh, the vowel cry of desire, the O of the overcome. O, oh, young, open your lover. The words say O, A, O, U, O. And the stanza break that interrupts their progression provides a moment of delicious hesitation. The poem's final verbs are lift, open, expand, widen, hold. Inside her metaphoric disguise, even though it is barely a disguise, Swenson is able to pour heat on the page, to be vulnerable, possessing, and possessed. Little Lion Face is a breathtaking performance on this bracing line between directness and disguise. I think that May Swenson must, of course, have been a shell collector, both because she lived by the sea on Long Island and because she was such a student of natural form, attendant to the structures the world presents and their possibilities for the poet. These two coiled metaphors on my desk, body as spare reverent, uh, body as spare revenant, as conundrum, hollowed out thing, and body as coiled voluptuary, sensuous container. I am keeping these shells for her. So that's sort of the end of the, of, of the, the written part of that. And uh, I guess I would like to, but before we just hear what you have to say about that and questions and comments and so on, I guess I would just um, want to say a, a few words about her in a more general way. Um, one of the things that's, that's so interesting to me about Swenson is her willingness 
to um, investigate practically any sort of emotional attraction that compels her. It's a very wide range in these poems. And you see that um, in the poems which are concerned with investigating physical experience, which in the two in front of us want to think about, well, what is the relationship between self and body? And the experience of, of desire, the, the, the power of lust. Um, elsewhere, uh, Swenson is willing to talk about uh, revulsion at, at, at the flesh, um, a, a sense of, of nausea at being uh, a, a corporate being, uh, uh, being uh, uh, subject to the indignities of, of, of being made of skin. Uh, she is willing to entertain all kinds of emotional nuances which seem to me to have a much wider range than um, many of the other poets of, of her day. And the poet to whom one cannot help but compare Swenson is, of course, Elizabeth Bishop, uh, a contemporary of hers, uh, also a poet of description and a poet profoundly interested in the natural world, and a poet whose um, enormous reputation has, in some way, I think, overshadowed Swenson's. I, I, maybe that one reason Swenson is less read uh, is because of Bishop's tremendous stature. Um, and admittedly, Swenson is a far more uneven poet. She wrote a great deal more and practiced a kind of, um, what would I want to call this, kind of dailiness in, in a way. There's a quality in her poems uh, she wishes to confront what each day presents to her and uh, to explore experience not necessarily significant, uh, not necessarily uh, where we would expect to find meaning or transcendence, but a kind of willingness to investigate uh, what arises, what occurs. Bishop, as we know, is a, um, a poet of a highly restricted lens who produced over the course of a lifetime relatively little work because, well, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that the principle of inclusion, what she's willing to say about herself and her experience is simply so narrow. So it's just something refreshing about encountering Swenson's breadth and willing to investigate. Um, and that is something that has been um, drawing me in the direction of her work because of this uh, relative degree of, of openness and uh, hmm, willingness to locate meaning where we don't expect to find it. Um, so that's a kind of <clears throat> Just an addendum. And we can go anywhere with that you might wish to go. I have a question that um, it's easier to ask about the poem question than it is to ask about <clears throat> little line of this. Um, and it's the question about subject matter, and it's exactly, I'm essentially just asking you to expand on your claim that she finds meaning and is willing to look for meaning in places that would otherwise seem inauspicious. Mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, because the other way, of the negative side of this, the critical thing to say is that the poem seems slight mm -hmm. in terms of subject matter. So, um, I uh, what I'm interested in, <coughs> to, to ask critically, sort of what, if you could say more about subject matter, not just about Swenson, but just in general, mm -hmm. and in relation to the, in relation to the, the strategy of figuration, that is, what you, what you spoke about at the outset about sort of your own imagination is drawn to figures. Try it this way. Try it another way. Try it another mm -hmm. way. Um, what is, I mean, from a sort of modernist perspective, that's um, insufficiently austere as a way of, of proceeding? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and one, one thinks of the the, um, the annotations in the Wasteland manuscript, Pound's annotation. You know, sort of get it straight. What is it that you're you're, you're saying? So, right. what is the answer? To that and that call for settle the matter, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and um, 
and what do you think, you know, I think just those two things are in relation to each other, the ostensible slightness of the subject. Sure. Well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really glad that you, you link those two things uh, because the uh, pointing to the legacy of modernism points to uh, the, the immense degree of pressure placed upon subject matter and upon uh, you know, the objective correlative, the, the, the exact words necessary in its pound terms to convey the thing at hand, and only the exact words. And the, the, one of the, the legacies of that kind of practice is a certain degree of restrictiveness, isn't it, where only that which is uh, capable of yielding meaning with a capital M is allowed onto the page in, in the poem. And one of the things that, that uh, seems to me startling now in reading Swenson is this kind of um, notational quality or let's say notebook quality to reading groups of the poems where bits and pieces of observation, uh, stray moments of, of encounter with the natural world, with perceptions of other people and observation about form seem in themselves to be sufficient for the making of the poem. And uh, the gift of that, um, which may not be so evident a poem at a time, but becomes evident in encountering the body of work, is the inscription of the character of a perceiver. So one comes away from, from reading a body of Swenson's work with the sense of having encountered a sensibility engaged in the stuff of her experience. And some of that stuff uh, would under a more rigorous principle of inclusion have been edited out, have been considered either uh, a slight or, or worse, a little too messy to be the subject matter of, of the poem, the triggering encounter. So, so for instance, the way that uh, little lion face addresses lust, loca desire, located in a female body, and clearly uh, lust for another female body. Seems to me something that that um, you know, rigorous pressure for significance might not have allowed onto the, the page. So there's a kind of freedom about this work that uh, has a cost, which is unevenness, and has a reward which is the breadth of range and the, uh, well, well the, the scale of experience which is brought to bear uh, in the work, which becomes available to us as readers. Mm -hmm. In Bishop, the experience is often narrow as you said but there's but in terms of refiguration and mm -hmm. also in terms of the setting because of the traveling and so forth there is actually a kind of presence of historic of colonialism of of, of war and uh, is sort of a big a big historical canvas <coughs> that's behind at least the figures mm -hmm. whereas here that's you know that's this is more austere than Bishop in hmm. that sense. You know, she's more, uh, you know, there are Jesuits in her poems, you know, and Jesuits in the jungle, and, uh, and that's, um, uh, this is much leaner and more uh, focused on reading analogies in, in, um, in a tr traditional um, kind of, kind of allegorization. Um, but um, but with a kind of fencing out of historical um, historical context, is that something that seems uh, characteristic of the work generally to you, and part of its attraction, you think, or is this just my drawing conclusions from this? The, these two are uh, rather more spare than um, a good deal of, of the work, and it is so. Uh, rangy and inclusive that in fact there are uh, moments of attention to popular culture, uh, various historical events, uh, social phenomena. So that gets on the page in the poems. But you point towards um, a huge difference 
in the aesthetic of these two women or in, in their aesthetic practice, which is that the Bishop poems, perception is so pressurized by, I think, all that she does not say. So in her observation, say, of the, the fish hauled out of the water and hung beside the boat, uh, we know nothing about the circumstances of that woman who is holding the fish out of the water, but presumably there is a real urgency in her quest for an emblem of survivorship, a need to locate victory. We are not allowed to see the occasion of that need. We are allowed to feel its tremendous pressure on figure, really. So all that goes unsaid goes into the figure. This is very beautiful. And it is why poems like The Fish or At the Fish Houses or The Moose have the tremendous vibrating power that they do. But it is also why so much is, le is off stage in Bishop Poems, right? It, it, it's why uh, so much can't come into the camera eye because it's a kind of poetic that will not allow that to take place. I think it's absolutely beautiful and I found myself I guess particularly among my students, looking at my students who are beginning to chafe at its influence um, because I wanted to see a little more of a sense of, of freedom and emotional range and inclusivity. And I think this is part of the reason of my, of my advocacy of, of this poet, that uh, there are other possibilities here uh, besides the uh, great vibrating presence of the unspoken. You know, Swenson's ethos, her, her, her method is, let's say it. Let's see what happens when we say it and investigate it. Yeah, just, um, this, this I think follows uh, on the heels of that question. You know, um, one of the things that I'm struck by in your framing of this poet and your presentation of her is that the tremendous impulse, even in the midst of transport, as in Little Lion Face, uh, toward uh, consciousness, toward registration of moments. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, in question, her first concern um, about being unhoused in the body is where she's going to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, um, as though to have a body or to have the possibility of not being conscious, uh, but to be deprived of one's body is to be deprived of the privilege not to see mm. um, the wind for an eye, right? That can never presumably close. Um, the, the privilege not to illuminate. Uh, and yet, in these poems in particular, there is a kind of uniform illumination that just moves from thing to thing, sparing nothing. And I'm wondering, because I don't know Swenson's work in a very capacious way, um, whether that impulse, that desire, registered but not experienced in the poem or not provided as a, uh, an opportunity within the poem not to see things um, or to uh, shut consciousness down um, is a part of the, uh, the poetry except as a foreclosed desire. Mm -hmm. uh, and here it seems to be offered as the, the one thing most important about the body, but also not available anywhere in the poems here that I see. Right. Um, actual unconsciousness or the possibility of unconsciousness. That's, I think th that's extremely perceptive because this um, intense notation of perception and of feeling goes on throughout the poems, even when what is being seen is uh, repugnant to, to the speaker. Um, her interest uh, in writing about revulsion is particularly uh, uh, compelling to me because it is um, uh, one of those uh, you know, disgust like embarrassment or, or uh, social anxiety are subjects which very rarely appear in 20th century American poetry, for who knows why. And the subjects where, uh, emotions where we don't expect to find transcendence, I suppose. And so there's a poem um, in which she's contemplating the fecundity of nature with just absolute, uh, uh, just, just distaste for the idea that the world just produces and produces and she just can't stand it anymore. Um, yet there is never that um, overt impulse to turn off the switch. And, and not look. It's more a matter of I'm going to keep looking and looking at every bit of this range of experience. Well, the, the, um, 
And it seems to me like that question of the representation of unconsciousness um, is important for somebody who's a poet of dailiness, mm -hmm. like you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Um, if she is a poet who's kind of documenting a daily experience and the dailiness of experience and bringing that over into poetry, then, um, then you know, the problem for that kind of you know, journal kind of writing is the times when uh, one is not awake. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed like there was kind of an interesting place where that space enters into representation in the second poem, um, which begins with a, uh, it begins ret retrospectively, right? Little line phase, I stooped to pick among the massive thick succulent blooms, and then in the next uh, page, of, uh, you know, the sudden stings from them were sweet. And then, um, then we move into the present tense, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm bold to touch your swollen neck. So we've moved from the plucking of it to the actual, you know, <coughs> touching of the, of the flower. And then uh, at the end of the next stanza, uh, in the space between uh, I leave you, Don's appetite to renew our glide and suck, to an hour ahead of sun I come to find you. In that stanza break, it seems like the speaker has gone to sleep and then woken up the next day. Right. right? So that there's a kind of nightfall and mm -hmm. uh, sleep happens. There's a gap. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I have a, a question that's related to that, which is something like, um, that, although I agree with your reading, <clears throat> it also seems like um, there's really not a question that anything might change during that sleep. Like it actually is a sort of pause that allows the 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 flower to sort of you know be there again, and it seems mm -hmm. like there's really <clears throat> there's a sense of this, that this poem is is um, constructed around a kind of cyclical time, um, and I guess my question is something like um, when I think of Swenson, I think of her as someone, especially when thinking when I'm thinking about her in, in relation to the body, she's as someone who's really sort of um, frets a lot about the ter deterioration of the body. Mm -hmm. And these are two poems which seem to um, really avoid that, like even question, which is sort of, which is about the body going away. It's still like you sort of start with, you know, the body and then it sort of, it really does go away. Like there's no sense of like, um, there's not a worry about like when the hound doesn't run, <clears throat> doesn't like, you know, catch the, find the whatever has been, you know, brought down or when the, the horse doesn't run fast enough. Um, when the roof falls in, it's really just sort of like um, from something to nothing. And it seems like that's the same, in a way, the same kind of time scheme. Um, there's something very sure about it. Mm. And so I guess I'm just, I'm wondering um, maybe why some of the sort of um, more, I think sort of what Bob was talking about, the more sort of historically specific um, poems, which do tend to address um, questions like that, um, don't come in. To, to, to her work or to? No, to like, to, to sort of your discussion of her work. Like. Oh. Well, th this is, um, you know, what I, what I would like to do uh, ultimately is to uh, uh, collect a, a number of poems of hers which take other sorts of positions towards the flesh so that there's, a, a for instance, this experience of uh, absolute uh, discomfort with, with being embodied, um, which shows up elsewhere. And, and there are, are others where there are other kinds of... Uh, erotic uh, raptures. Uh, there is a fascinating poem about um, uh, refusing to, to have children and um, therefore um, uh, feeling that you are ending your parents' influence in the world. Right? <laughs> um, so, so there are many ways in which uh, this particular uh, uh, meditation could keep being extended to uh, broaden that sense of the body. I, I guess I do think that the poems of hers in which um, history enters in the form of uh, attention to uh, the, the, the news of the hour are, are often lesser poems, mm -hmm. uh, as, as if uh, the, the, the particular way of making that she had evolved for herself was not particularly successful in accommodating that. It's there, but um, 
it feels like uh, it feels less interestingly digested. I guess I'm just feeling like this is a very like <clears throat> like it's a, a sort of it's a Swenson that's very that's filled with pathos, and mm -hmm. I think that's actually quite suited to, to your talk. Mm. But it's also like a really comforting Swenson, hmm. like, um, which maybe is really good for a first Swenson conference because mm. it's actually a much more comfortable Swenson than. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Well, there's, you know, I probably need to include, there's, there's a poem about watching, a, a, a famous poem about watching a, a sunset over the water in which the sun becomes this big hydroencephalic head, which is sort of breaking in the waves. And it, it's clearly a poem of just uh, uh, distaste. And, and perhaps that kind of discomfort is needed to balance this. So thinking about Jenny's observation uh, about the absence of essentially of aging, Mm -hmm. that the body isn't aging, it's either an efficient uh, animal of pursuit or mm. nothing right. uh, there, that, uh, that, there's, that that's unrealistic as a, as a uh, discussion of what happens to the body in time. And I think that's right because, um, and it, I think it tells you something about both poems, because oh. the dandelion is, I mean, it's the paradoxical flower because it looks so great. Uh, but it, it dies really quickly <coughs> right. and becomes nothing, uh, and um, mm. that's what she's that's what she's interested in. Not in the slow drying, slow decline of the flower, but that this this thing is closes up uh, uh -huh. to nothing. So it's, and I think and I think the conclusion to draw from that is that despite all the focus on the body, is a very intellectual poem. Mm. That is, she's not she's not she's really focused on the question of. What what is what is the body, uh, or what is the the glory of uh, of sensual presence, not in time, but just in you know it's it's either there or it's not. That's what she's interested in, not in the shades of a continuum of passing in time. What your body when your hair falls out or uh -huh. when your wrinkles come. That's not it. That's not <coughs> that, the analytical problem. The sort of philosophical problem is what is the body. You know, there or not there, and that's the level at which she's dealing with it in these in these poems, not in the graduate. I mean, think of the great the great um, one art, uh, which is about time. Mm -hmm. You know, about a gradual process. Uh, and if this were a poem about sensual experience, really, it would be about process in time, and oh. it's more about a mind focusing on what is the body, what is sensual, sensual beauty. Although I, I would argue in, in the case of Little Lion Face that the, <coughs> on a sonic level, the poem uh, is more than an intellectual contemplation of the, the body, but um, enacts that pleasure in desire through by vocalizing. Well, the body is most intense. It's about intensity on some level. Mm -hmm. And intens intensity and decline are not compatible modes. I mean, the, the duration of decline is different from the duration of intensity. I mean, the, and, and I, I couldn't speak for other poems. I mean, these two are, are poems of, of great physical vitality and the on-off switch, and because it, it's lingering over every little bit of intense nuance here. So I mean, there's something, I think, I do think there's something, I, I agree with you, Bob, because it kind of links up with Orrin's comment about sort of consciousness and not consciousness. Mm -hmm. But it's about the intense physicality of consciousness, too, in that second poem. You're experiencing your body very intensely. Um, so. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like you're being awfully hard on the second poem. Uh, no, not you. I'm just <laughs> 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 I'm not knocking on these poems. I was just say, wondering why some of the like less less intense sensual sensing wasn't um, part of the talk. Hmm. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just going to say personal you know, preference. I don't think that. <laughs> while I think that, um, I, I guess I was implying that um, they're not being an available alternative to consciousness in these poems. Um, might be a limit or a problem. Um, I don't think it's the same as being as intellectualizing experience, that is, registering and noting and taking in and not wanting to let it go, not wanting to let it pass out of the eye. Right? I mean, this, this poem ends, right? Um, 
I hold you, lion, in my eyes, sun up until night, right? Um, there may be a moment when the, when the, uh, the speaker sleeps, but um, unconsciousness is other people's unconsciousness in this poem, yeah. right? Um, your twisted shutters of our neck drooped unconscious. I am never unconscious. I am never unconscious. That there's an imperative toward consciousness, but I'm not sure I would necessarily say that that's the same as an imperative toward intellectualization. I think this is a deeply, I mean, I find this a, you know, a deeply passionate poem. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a passion of an analytical mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the gentleman's been waiting to speak here. Available alternatives to figuration, mm -hmm. or in which another way of asking the question would be to ask after the function of figuration, which is clearly um, a decisive feature um, mm -hmm. in, your, in your talk. Um, and I want to think about this in terms of um, aperture <coughs> and closure. When you speak of uh, the Bishop as uh, a poet whose um, uh, influence, at least, has foreclosed something in, in younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other poets' work that, that you've seen, um, and you speak of Swenson's influence as um, apertural, as allowing allowing things in, um, and you also speak of investigation, uh, which is which is a key word for me as well in, in thinking of um, in thinking of poetry. Um, mm -hmm. But I wonder whether figure can't come to foreclose. Hmm. Investigation. Of course, of course. In right. I mean, Joan Ritalik writes about um, the need for a poem to rise to its occasion right. rather than rising above its occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and she's engaging with, I think, the influence of high modernism and, and, and various other um, codes and canons that are out there. Um, just to bring this um, to one of the poems on the page that has been much discussed, Little Lion Face. Um, on the one hand, yeah, this is clearly an allegorical poem, right? Sensual, whether intellectual or not, it is having something to do with, uh, with the senses. Um, and and uh, absolutely. But at the same time, that, that would be the figural reading. But you could also allow some literal facts in, and that would be just to say, in fact, flowers are genitalia. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. flowers are. Right. Um, which isn't to dismiss the figural angle at all, but something like glide and suck. I've not seen um, bees or butterflies um, nursing at dandelions, which is actually not the most sensual of flowers, but I have seen uh -huh. them nursing at more, uh, more exotic flowers. So uh -huh. which is to say that I wonder whether the figural reading that you've, you've performed, which I'm, which I'm convinced by, wouldn't be enabled further still by some uh, attention to the literal. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you maybe speak something, say something towards this um, this gap. Well, only that that uh, I mean, I, th I think you're, you're right that that poem is is readable in a more on a more literal level, um, and yet I think the way that figuration becomes a, a means of of shutting down possibilities of, of limiting inquiry is when it is uh, is, is taken to literally, right? Or when its, its project is, is not made self-conscious. So one of the interesting things about both of these poems is that they put the process of figuration in the foreground. And in uh, question, uh, figure is proposed, discarded, proposed, discarded. A uh, new one appears. It's clear that none of them will really do, although they keep turning back around. There's this restless project of trying to find a trope for the body. In Little Lion Face, I think that uh, she very much wants us to entertain the figure and see through it. And that this is a kind of, essentially a kind of uh, performance on her part, a way of being in the closet and out of it simultaneously, something she performs in other poems as well, and uh, takes delight in being seen but not exactly named. So um, that would not be quite possible if the figure were more um, uh, precisely allied, right, if vehicle and tenor are, are just have this clearly logical and transparent relationship, but because it's a little bit problematic, I think um, that's um, evidence of a self-consciousness in the way they're employed.
So I would say that, that um, figuration which questions itself, um, which uh, acknowledges a limit where uh, you know, the writer stands with a raised eyebrow in relationship to it or perhaps proposes alternative figures, uh, is a way of intensifying the act of inquiry and making figure a less uh, uh, kind of automatic process. Yeah. Um, this is a slightly different sort of question from the one that's been asked. Um, you glanced in your talk towards um, the Renaissance, and I, uh, the poems actually seem to me to have both of them to be in really deep dialogue with mm. the Renaissance, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I wonder if um, you could. Uh, say a little bit more about uh, some of the connections you've seen. And maybe I'll frame it in this way. Both, both seem, uh, in, in ways that you've been describing, to be um, looking towards the absolute, to, for an absolute or towards an absolute, in ways that I, maybe because of my reading, my reading and my work in the Renaissance poetry, are like, absolutely familiar. Mm. So when I come upon the word that Eric has mentioned, suck, and that you, you know, absolutely, it's the pressure point of the poem, but it's like jumping, you just jump back three centuries. Mm. Because it's, the, it, it's, it's a word that just instantly brings Johnson, Johnson Shakespeare, Shakespeare Johnson, and, and, and the sons of Ben to mind. Mm. So the, mm. uh, what? The, the, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, so um, and then in question, and that, absolutely, I mean, absolutely. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, do you detect her mining that body of poetry for, um, uh, for in, in order to discover a kind of vocabulary for the, for the, the play and dance that you're describing? Oh, ab absolutely. And I, I actually uh, love the notion of, of reading Little Lion Face as, uh, you know, a lesbian revision of uh, you know any one of a number of Dunn's love poems, right? And you can just it seems very clear to me. Um, and, and again, those those are poems that, in such profound ways, make the act of figuration uh, the the pivot of thinking. That the the, uh, the the work of understanding in the poem is accomplished through the presentation of, of the metaphor and the, the worrying out of its implications. And I suppose, uh, now, now you would know this better than I would, but I, I would think what would distinguish Little Lion Face as a, uh, a 20th century version of same is that there's a certain degree, I think, of, of winking going on by the narrator at the, um, the excess of her own metaphor and the, uh, uh, the playfulness with which it is deployed. I think I, 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 that, that seems right. The, um, you, you, you're going to get a version of that in Dunn. But then what's, what's interesting is also how I think she, she must know Johnson very, very well. Mm. Partly when you described when you described her as uh, her practice as a practice of writing daily poems, mm -hmm. and occasional poems. You know, Johnson provides a provides a model for that so, and a kind of restraint that nonetheless allows him then to put incredible pressure on a particular word in ways that, that, that also, um, uh, that, that you're describing in your life, for it is danger or treasure. The, the way that that, that, that kind of comes under pressure exactly because, um, uh, oh, I've kind of lost my thought, but it, it, exactly because, um, I can't remember, the way that it comes under pressure seems, seems, seems um, uh, a second model for in a second model for intensity that um, parallel parallel to the the intensity of excess. Hmm. There, there's a lot of um, I mean I, I, when you said notebook like quality you know I just thought of course of Lowell and his also I mean he couldn't be more different mm -hmm. in style but not mm -hmm. in, but perhaps in practice I mean this kind of sense that absolutely everything at all times is material for the poem. The poem is kind of, ne it actually never stops. You just, you're almost always, you know, turning everything you experience back into, onto the page. Mm -hmm. And, you know, O'Hara was the same way, although, you know, again, in different modes, but this practice of, and this de-emphasizing of the, the austere large ideas is so much a part of the work of, for late 20th century poets. Right. It's a kind of, 
decayed <coughs> from the august. Right. Uh, to and, and, to, and to some degree to sort of resist the epiphanic, to, yeah. to, oh, yeah. to, to go Absolutely. for... Uh, a little epiphany. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, and sort of <coughs> always with a little bit of irony, too, that you've, you've actually been seduced into the epiphanic moment and right. you've got to kind of compress it again or, or disclaim it or something like that. Um, and she, she's very different in style, but that seems to be something that is... A, widespread practice. It, it does, although, you know, in Lowell's case, it never quite loses the sense that, that he believes he, he's about to stumble upon the, the, the earth shattering, right? right. right. So if he keeps doing it, he'll yeah. eventually have, have <laughs> Yes. Right. And, and that in, in oh, right, or that he, he just might be, you know, too much of a wreck to quite get to the big moment <laughs> just now. Um, and, and in O'Hara's case, the sense that, uh, that the, the dailiness is always uh, so uh, inflected by, uh, you know, the, the, the raised eyebrow. And the, the the wonderful kind of um, ironic stance towards you know whatever he, he both feels things and watches himself feeling at the same time, and there there is uh, much less uh, of the ironic on the stage in, in these poems and a, a, a sense of uh, well, I think about this this do you know that it's kind of beautiful essay by Van Bolen called the Dilemma of the Woman Poet. And in this essay, she's talking about um, having the experience of, of uh, taking care of a baby on a very hot, sort of sticky afternoon and going to pick up the child and feeling this real sense of uh, the presence of the corporal. You know, here, here's, the, here's her child who is this hot, overbearing, and beautiful physical presence. And she finds herself a little later going to write about this and on the one hand having a tradition behind her that says, no, you're not supposed to locate transcendence in moments like, like this. You should be writing, you know, elegies. You should be writing, you know, great poems of spiritual discovery. And on the other hand, hearing more recent feminist voices in her ear saying, you know, no, you can't write about finding meaning and holding your baby, right? So that she feels sort of torn in half by these pressures of what, what is not to be said in the poem. And I, I bring this to, to bear in this conversation because I think Swenson seems to have found some method, I mean perhaps because she, she preceded some of this, but she also just sort of dispels a lot of notions about what ought to be poetic, what might lend itself. And um, the, the result of that is um, a kind of, I mean I used the word unevenness earlier, and, and that unevenness is not necessarily a uh, lapse of, of craft, but it may be how much weight we as readers are willing to give to some aspects of experience, what she chooses to address. Yet, at the same time, there is something tonic about this breadth of attention. Yeah. And, and somewhat, um, uh, something, something a little revolutionary, or, or, or at least a uh, a, a willingness to inscribe women's experience uh, in a more fulsome fashion. Yeah. Um, you, you seem to, um, in your piece, to have divided these two poems into sort of one as a as an erotic poem and the other as a, a metaphysical. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wondered if question can also be an erotic poem. That's an interesting point. point. Um, about the horse and, and the hound. Um, yeah. I just think of the sort of um, topos of, of loving as a sort of chase and um, her question is, what, what will happen when that chase is not, when, when that chase is not present, when it falls away? Yeah, it's a wonderful reading. You think about you know, where I go without my mount all eager and quick, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. and, and so it, we, we don't necessarily have to assume that body being addressed is my body, but, but being in the company of the body, you know, your body, you know, our bodies, which is, is a marvelous way to think about the poem. I will, I'll make use of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much for your comments. You've really helped me to think about um, what, what else to do here. <laughs>